World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. You really cannot know God without knowing His Word. Think about that. You really cannot know God without knowing His Word, the Bible. In Psalm 119, verses 104 and 105, the psalmist declares, Through your precepts I gain understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. How we need to think of God's Word for what it is. Something that will cause us to hate every false way because it is true. It is a lamp that can guide us all the way home to be with Jesus in heaven. I want you to know that the Bible is a book from God. And it is about God and the relationship that He longs to have with you and me. The Bible is a book about salvation. As we look at the Old Testament and think about its incredible message concerning God, let me highlight some of the things we've talked about from prior studies. In the book of Genesis, God is a God of power. He is a God of power and might. He simply speaks the universe into existence and it is very good according to Genesis chapters 1 and 2. He speaks and it is done. Psalm 33 verses 6 through 9. In the book of Exodus, we read of the faithfulness and mercy of God. The children of Israel are in captivity to Egypt and God in His faithfulness and mercy releases them and He brings them out of captivity, bondage, and gives them His law. We come to the book of Leviticus and Leviticus is about the holiness of God, that God is completely and inefficably holy. Holiness is one of those attributes of God that is three-peated. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Isaiah 6 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. Then we come to the book of Numbers and what does it tell us about God? By way of summation, God is a God of justice and a God of providence. He provides for His people. In the book of Numbers, you have the children of Israel, the people of God, behaving in a disobedient, murmuring, complaining way repeatedly until finally God punishes a generation. But even then, He blesses in His providence. God may punish us, and yet He has still been so very good to us. The Word of God says, Those that I love, I reprove and chasten. Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Then we come to the book of Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy emphasizes, it accentuates the love of God. Because God has been so good and faithful and a God who keeps covenant, God's people are to respond in love and obedience. That was true of Israel then, and it should be true of anyone who wants to follow God now. Having looked at those books of law, consider the book of Joshua. And what Joshua does is tell us about God's Word, God's veracity. He keeps His Word. He is a God who is a God of truth, and He gives them the promised land, the land of Canaan. When you look at the book of Judges, it emphasizes the righteousness of God. While every man did that which was right in his own eyes, Judges 21 and verse 25, there's a higher standard than that. There always has been, and that is the righteousness of God. It is the Word of God that will judge us in the last day. John 12 and verse 48. When we look at the book of Ruth, we see the redemptive care of God. God cares for people, and in His providence, He blesses. 
When we look at the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, here's what we learn about God, God's reign, R-E-I-G-N. God is the king. God is sovereign. Because our God is in the heavens, He has done whatsoever He pleased. Psalm 115 and verse 3, He works all things out after the counsel of His will. Ephesians 1 and verse 11, The Lord God omnipotent reigns. Revelation 19 and verse 6, Our God, the only God, is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the only sovereign He is. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and Revelation 19 and verse 16. And we're to pick up with the books of 1st and 2nd Chronicles at this time. In looking at 1st and 2nd Chronicles, I think it's important to bring out a comparison. A comparison between 1st and 2nd Chronicles, which were originally one book, so we'll just say Chronicles, with the books prior, 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings. When you look at Samuel and Kings, there is an emphasis upon the prophet, the prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, the prophet. And by that I mean you read 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings and it's not unusual to read of prophets like Samuel and Nathan and Elijah and Elisha and Micaiah. But when you look at the book of Chronicles, when you look at 1st and 2nd Chronicles, it is about Priest, priest. When you think about uh, Samuel and kings, there is an emphasis upon history, history, and political history. But when you look at the books of Chronicles, they are about religious history, not merely political history. They look at historical events from a religious perspective and how God evaluates things. That's what Chronicles does. And it's interesting that about 40% of the material contained in 1st and 2nd Chronicles can be found in 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings. But as we continue, when you look at the books of Samuel and Kings, there's an emphasis upon wars and battles. There's a lot of blood. When you think about 1st and 2nd Chronicles, there is an emphasis upon the temple, the temple of God. As you look at Samuel and as you look at Kings, there is an emphasis upon the nation, the nation of Israel, united and divided and as it falls. As you look at the book of Chronicles, catch the contrast. There is an emphasis on the lineage, the line of David, the line of David. And when you look at the books of Samuel and Kings, there's an emphasis upon man's failures but when you look at the books of 1st and 2nd Chronicles, there is a profound emphasis upon God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. So what the books of 1st and 2nd Chronicles do in a very beautiful way, in a majestic way, is remind us that there is a God in heaven. He reigns over all, 1st Chronicles 29 and verse 11. And this God should be heeded. He should be obeyed. He should be loved and known. As we think about this book, think about how 1st and 2nd Chronicles relate to the overriding theme of the Bible, the salvation of man to the glory of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1st and 2nd Chronicles reminds us of some great truths. The salvation of man to the glory of God through Christ Jesus our Lord, that's the theme of the Bible. When sin occurred in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, a relationship was devastated, a relationship was broken between man and God. 
God is a pure eyes and to look upon sin. Habakkuk 1 and verse 13, your sins have separated you and your God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. But God wants to be glorified and praised. He is still the king. He is still on the throne. Even though Satan has entered the realm, even though sin has broken man's relationship with God, and it is through Jesus Christ of the descent of David, of the royal line of David, that men can be saved and that God can be praised and honored as the great and wondrous God that He is by His creation, mankind. When you look at First and Second Chronicles, they cover an amazing, a breathtaking amount of material. From First Chronicles chapter 1 and mention being made of Adam, to 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and the decree of the Persian king Cyrus that Israel could return from the Babylonian captivity. It's an amazing amount of time and yet it can be synthesized as follows. Let me give you an outline of the book of 1 Chronicles. In 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9, here's the first main point, main division. The royal line of David. The royal line of David. And then when you look at 1 Chronicles, here's the second part of the outline. 1 Chronicles chapter 10 to the end of the book, verse, uh, chapter 29 the royal reign of David. The royal line of David, the royal reign of David, 10 through 29. Let me give you a couple of key verses for 1 Chronicles and then we're going to look at five great themes in this book. One of the key verses simply has to be, in my judgment, 1 Chronicles chapter 17 verses 11 through 14. In 1 Chronicles 17 verses 11 through 14, we have an account that is paralleled in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 through 16. What is said is this, God says to David that your offspring, one of your sons, I will be his father. He says of this one who would come, I will be his father. He will build a house. He will have a throne and a kingdom that shall last forever. It shall be established. And oh, my listening friend, oh, listening friend, this must be a prophecy of Jesus because Jesus built a house. 1 Timothy 3.15 Jesus is a king and has his kingdom Hebrews 12 and verse 28, Colossians 1 verses 12 and 13, a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus is the Son of the Father. John 1, 1 through 18. Here's another key verse, 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 11. You, that is God, reign over all. In a world that is saturated with sin, where we often see wickedness abounding and seeming to get the upper hand, seeming to come out ahead of things that are good and right and holy, we need to remember that God has not abdicated the throne. God is still on the throne. How we need to trust Him, love Him, and obey Him. Now here are the five concepts I'd like for you to keep in mind. If 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9 deal with the royal line of David, it's a long series of genealogies which really provide the skeletal framework to remind us that from the very beginning of time, God has had a plan whereby He would save men from their sins. And it's going to involve the line, the lineage of David, from whom Jesus the Savior would come. That makes it important. 
And it tells us that God's plan in Jesus for saving us from our sins wasn't some afterthought wasn't something that God came up with after man sinned in the garden, but had been in God's mind from before the ages. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for our sakes. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 in hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before the world began, Titus 1 and verse 2. And then Ephesians 3 and verse 11. The eternal purpose that He purposed in Christ Jesus. So these nine chapters of genealogy, while they may be difficult reading, what they do is give us not only the pedigree for David, but the pedigree for the son of David, whom David would call Lord, Matthew 22, 41 and following. Then we look at the chapters that follow. Chapters 10 through 29. And here's where the five basic themes come in that I'd like for you to keep in mind. When you look at chapters 10 through 12 of 1 Chronicles, the emphasis is upon the throne the throne. What a great word, the throne. David sits on the throne because he recognizes that God sits on the throne. And then you look at chapters 13 through 16 of 1 Chronicles and the emphasis is upon the ark, the ark of the covenant. Some 40 or so times we read of the ark in the books of Chronicles. And it's in this section that we're reminded of the presence and power of God. That as long as leaders and countries acknowledge the presence and power of God, they can be blessed. And then as we keep on reading, chapters 16 and 17 emphasize the covenant, the agreement, the arrangement the testament, if you will, that existed between God and man and especially the Old Testament system under which Israel lived. As you keep looking at this, there is an emphasis on battle. In 1 Chronicles chapters 18 through 20, there is mention made of battle and war, but not nearly to the degree that we will find in the books of Samuel and Kings. Think about it and think of this idea. Today as the people of God, we are engaged in spiritual conflict, in spiritual warfare, how we need to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Ephesians 6 and verse 10, our sufficiency is of the Lord. And then as we move on from chapters 21 to the end of the book, chapter 29, the key word is temple, temple. In chapter 22, God and David have a plan for the temple. But in chapters 23 to the end of the book, chapter 29, the people are involved in putting together the materials and the money necessary for the construction of the temple. David could not build the temple because he was a man of war. However, he was able to prepare for the building of the temple that would occur during the reign of his son, Solomon. There's a couple of passages to note as we conclude the book of 1 Chronicles. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9, there's a passage that I think every father should consider as it deals with the family. Only know the God of your father and serve Him with a perfect heart, a sincere heart, and with a willing mind. Would to God, I wish it would be true, that every husband, every father would say to their family, only only know the God of your father and serve Him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 5, Who is willing to consecrate themselves wholly to the Lord? Who is willing to give freely? The idea is... And the people of Israel gave freely to
to the erection of the temple, to the construction of the temple. What a marvelous thought. How do we give? David put it this way in 2 Samuel 24 and verse 24, I will not offer unto God that which costs me nothing. We ought to give freely and generously. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7, of money, of time, of love, of service, because our God is so great and so good. Now 2 Chronicles. When we get to 2 Chronicles, it can be divided into two sections as well. The reign of Solomon and Israel's glory. Israel's glory. 2 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9. 2 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9. Then we come to the second part of this great book. Again, covering a tremendous amount of history from the reign of Solomon until the time that Cyrus issues a decree that those who had been in Babylonian captivity could return to their homeland, that the Jews, the people of God, could return home. This is a significant amount of time. It includes the United Kingdom in its glory, the kingdom dividing and then the northern and the southern kingdoms going into captivity. The north to Assyria in 722 B.C. and the south, Judah, in 586 B.C. to Babylon. But as we look at this, the first nine chapters do concern themselves with Israel's glory in the reign of Solomon. And then from chapter 10 to the end of the book, chapter 36. What we have is this, Israel's disgrace. Israel's disgrace. Because 1 Kings 11 and verse 11, the kingdom would be rent, it would be torn, it would sever, it would split into north and south. That's what God told Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 11. Due to his sin in loving many women and allowing them to lead him astray concerning God. His son's name was Rehoboam. He would be the king of the southern kingdom. Jeroboam would be the king of the northern kingdom. And as you read through the history in 2 Chronicles, here's what you're going to find. That the northern kingdom, begun by Jeroboam and followed by other kings, it lasted some 208 years and it fell to Assyria. On the other hand, the southern kingdom, Rehoboam and the kings that would follow, while there were a number of kings of each kingdom, no kings of the north were good and righteous and truly followed the Lord. But in the southern kingdom there were some, and the southern kingdom existed for 345 years. In other words, it lasted approximately 135 years longer, no doubt because of some of the men who pursued God and the course of righteousness. So 1 through 9 of 2 Chronicles deal with the reign of Solomon, the height and glory of Israel, and especially the construction of the temple. And then from chapter 10 through 36, Israel's disgrace as they forget the fact that God reigns and is a God of righteousness who's to be pursued, and they go into captivity. What I'd like to do as we look at these last few moments of our study is look at five times of revival that the southern kingdom had. In 2 Chronicles chapter 15, there is revival mentioned under Asa. Under Asa. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, revival is mentioned under Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Then in 2 Chronicles 24, revival is mentioned under King Joash. Joash. In 2 Chronicles 29, revival occurs under a king, Hezekiah. 
And then in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, revival occurs. Revival occurs under one more king. As you think about revival, revival has to do with this spiritual uh, enlightenment, with a time of renewed interest in God and the things of God. Judah is blessed by God because some kings were interested in reformation, in revival, in spiritual renewal, in seeking God and His righteousness. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. That's what the writer of Proverbs tells us. You know, as we think about the possibility of reform and revival, one thing I want to bring out, None of these kings in 2 Chronicles, however sincere their intentions and good those men may have been, none of those men were able to keep a reform going. It lasted only one generation or so, if that. They were not complete reforms true revivals in the fullest sense of the word. There is some life being breathed into the people as far as the things of God are concerned, but not truly, fully, wholly following God with love and obedience. Today there is a lot of reformation and discussion of religion and of God. However, we need to go beyond mere reformation to restoration, to simply be doing Bible things in Bible ways and calling Bible things by Bible names. It's not enough to just want to have a reformation. As marvelous as that is, in some ways, we must go beyond reformation to true and genuine restoration. The seed is the Word of God, Luke 8, 11 through 15. And if we do now what God would have us do, if we will acknowledge His reign, and if we will humble ourselves and obey Him with the spirit of love, Galatians 5 and verse 6, there can be true restoration. There can be unity in matters of faith. There can be liberty in matters of opinion. And in all things, there can be love. The Bible would say, God reigns. First and second Chronicles remind us in such a beautiful way, God reigns. His throne is what matters. Who is your king? Is Jesus Christ truly your King? Have you just had some form of reformation, form of godliness? 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, And have denied the real power, or have you opened God's Word to truly be free?